welcome to the uh, the last of the if uh, talking shop discussions uh, today in the Arabian tent, which is nice and cosy. Um, I'm sorry about the weather, didn't have the power to change that this week, but uh, um, thank you for turning up in your thousands to um, to welcome Jenny Seeley, who's uh, director of uh, Grey Eye Theatre Company, uh, in conversation with me. So, uh, without further ado, let me just introduce Jenny for, for those of you who, who, who may know a bit about her. Um, Jenny is the um, Chief Executive and Artistic Director of Grey Eye Theatre Company, which puts uh, deaf and disabled actors centre stage. And a company that we have admired and um, worked with since the very first festival in 2010, um, when we presented Against the Tide. And then we presented uh, in 2014 Iron Man. And then in uh, 2016, we presented um, in the Spiegel tent uh, two concert performances of Reasons to be Cheerful, which were joyous, joyous uh, evenings. Uh, 2012, she was a bit busy. Um, she was she was the uh, co-artistic director of the Paralympic uh, opening ceremony and uh, um, we can maybe ask Jenny to tell us a little bit about that experience this morning too. Um, but why have we asked Jenny here? Because there is no grey eye piece in the th in in the, in this year's festival, um, but there probably will be in 2020 because we are today asking and inviting Jenny to be our artist in residence for 2020. And. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I think that was a yes. <laughs> um, and we'll talk a bit about um, our plans for, for 2020 and how that collaboration we think is going to work out. But just um, by way of background, the Stables, who, which is the, the producing entity uh, for the International Festival, is 50 years old in 2020. And it's our f so it's our 50th anniversary, but it's also Grey Eye's 40th anniversary which is 90 years. And it will also be 10 years since we started the International Festival. So um, it's our centenary, we, re we reckon, <laughs> between us. <coughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Jenny, tell us what you've been up to since we saw you last in, 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 in Milton Keynes. Well, first of all, good morning. Um, just to repeat what Manif said, thank you for, for coming. Sorry, I have realised we've been such a big part of this all these years. It, it does, when I arrived this morning, although it's raining, it feels like coming home, though. Seeing all the setup and, it's, oh, I can't wait for 2020 now. But um, I've been, had this very strange job over the last few months, working with, when I worked on the 2012 Paralympic opening ceremony, of which over there is Helen Parler, who was one of the choreographic, part of the choreographic team, so she knows what the whole process was like. But we did have a lot of um, disabled veterans as part of our core um, professional team. So they were all the circus artists in the air, on the sway poles, in the, the, the physical mix of everything. I carried on doing some work with some of those disabled veterans because they were saying that they'd never had any real space or time to think about their journey becoming disabled. And so we started doing some work with an artist called Mark Storer. And one of the things I asked them to do was tell their story of what happened to them as if they're telling it to a very small child. And one of them just told this amazing story he called it the limbless night came galloping along and he talked exactly about losing three limbs and his whole regeneration of him as a new person so that we then did a play called the limbless night but what kept going on and on in my head was they kept saying Jenny it's much better to come back dead than it is to become to come back disabled because there is not the support or the infrastructure or the... Well, there is the support, but there's something lacking in their journey to just recognise the new them. And then when, of course, the, um, 14, 18 hours established as the, the World War I Centenary uh, Commissioning Body, 
I apply to them to try and do some work with veterans, not so much to commemorate World War I, but to make a statement that we, they, there are no memorials for them. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds for the dead, but nothing that recognises them as the living. And I first started off desperately trying to get, a, wanting a sculpture to be made, the sculpture of the living. I failed to get any money for it, but I'm on it. I'm, I'm damned. I'm going to do it. I have to do it. Because there's a whole new rehabilitation place. Headley Court was where they used to go for rehab. There's a new place that's being built. I can't for the life of remember what it's called, sorry. But it's in um, Lincolnshire, but oh, it's in the Midlands somewhere. So it's a whole new rehab. And I want that statue for the living to be there in that idea to give hope to those young pe those people coming back with bits missing, that they can have a good life, they can be an active member of society. Anyway, so we called this big show, uh, which was written by Mike Kenny after many conversations with the veterans. This is, we called it, This Is Not For You. And the title came, one of the veterans said he was wheeling to the cenotaph uh, to lay his puppies, and some bright spark from the side shouted down, Oh, you! Bagger off! It's not for you, it's for the dead. And I thought, excuse me, this is for me. Ex so that became our title, and it really is the right title. So I've been working with um, 25 veterans, five of whom, whom are women, Half of the group did storytelling workshops, so they became the main narrators of the piece. Another half, we've done um, a whole term of training with Green Chops in Sheffield and National Centre for Circus, Circus Arts. And um, so they've been doing trapeze, static trapeze, um, hoops, really building on their, their physical st stuff, which they still have. And for some of them, just to re-evaluate how they can use their body has been really, really quite profound. And for some of them, the whole process of being in rehearsals with me, in a big space, with a microphone, screaming across the space, trying to get myself heard, and try to, um, try to say to them, you're here, of course you're here, because of your military experience, but you're here as disabled men and women, but more importantly than anything, you are here as my artists. They said, Jenny, we want you to run this like with military position. And I said, art's not military in that respect. <laughs> you know, and, and in one way, but there is, there is a position with theatre. You have to arrive on time, you know, you're, you're, you're queued by light, sound. There is a, an absolute military discipline within it. But I said, in our world, we get messy first, then we have the discipline. In your world, we have the discipline, then it's really messy afterwards. Do you know what I mean? And I, I kept it at Jenny, and I said, no, I, I'm not going to compromise my process. You are my artist, and if you are moving from over there to this table, I want to know why. I want to know what your motivation is, not because you, Jenny, said. And bit by bit... It did start to happen. I mean, there were conversations where they said, oh, Jenny, we really don't like doing this. Really not happy. Really hate it. Really don't want to be here. You know, I think I've been conned. I didn't think I'd be doing all this marching, this signing, this singing. I didn't think I'd be doing all this. Yeah, I don't like it. I was like, oh, my God. You know, I had to go and cry. It really upset me. But I thought, I'm, I'm going to hang on in there. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to let them get me down. And I just kept going. And then there was one amazing moment when I was organising them taking their uniforms off. They had a basic costume underneath with their dog tag information on. Taking their army bit off. Because it was hot. So hot when we were doing the show. And I said to one man, Mark, I said, Mark, you take your jacket off here. He went, no, Jenny. I said, but you're, you're faint in the heat. He said, Jenny, the next scene is my scene with Carol. I come home from war. I go to meet my wife. Of course I'm going to have my uniform on. I've been thinking about this. I thought, I said, Ma, you are thinking like a professional actor. 
You are thinking of an actor that's one step ahead, actually two steps ahead of the director. I hate you. But it was a moment when I thought, yeah, this is it, this is fine. I've, if I get one person to think like that, and then for two of them, they've stopped taking, well, one definitely stopped taking his PTSD tablets because they just felt a new calm, a sense of purpose, and enjoying the camaraderie and being within the theatre-making process. So it's been, it's been a journey. I mean, my God, it's been a journey. And the journey continues tomorrow. I go up to Stockton. And we are opening the Stockton Riverside, Riverside International Festival, which is a huge honour. Um, but already one of my girls fell in her garden, so she's damaged her stump, so her stump's all swollen, so she can't put her prosthetic on. So we've got to re-choreograph her stuff with the circus um, cuboid thing that we have. And I said to Carol, actually, you have much more freedom physically without your leg on. We, put, we did that in rehearsals. So you can still be part of the show. Of course we'll make it work. My other lovely actor, Billy, his eyes have been so badly blown up and the drops aren't working. He can't, he's not going to be able to do the movement we want, but he can have a stationary count. He could still be the narrator, and I've just got to recast somebody else in, re-choreograph things, and then having to make that choice, does this new other actor have his legs on or his legs off in his wheelchair? Oh, and we've got two days to rehearse, two afternoons to rehearse. Oh, my God. And we've got a community choir, and that's what's been amazing. You know, it's, it's been composed by this beautiful slip of a boy. He's a man, but he's wheelchair user, it's very fine featured, very quiet man, because of his physical disability, he's got he whispers, and he's just tiny, but what comes out in terms of how he composes music, oh my god, you know, and he will sit with me as a deaf person, I do love music, but I have to be told what it is I'm hearing, so Oliver will sit with me and just explain it, and I said, Oliver, will you write me my Jerusalem? And that last song, it's a song of being alive, and everyone sings it. And even thinking about it now, I can feel my hair poking through my, my jacket. It's just this, it's got the right notes there for me, and I love him for that. And it is, it's, it's good music, isn't it? It is. And one of the interesting things you mentioned there was working with the community choir. And I'm intrigued because this whole paradox of having to work with veterans who are sort of drilled effectively and told what to do in the in the military and you're asking them to think for themselves which is kind of the antithesis of what happens when you're in the military you have to follow instructions choirs are quite similar actually choirs have to be instructed quite often they're not they're not asked to sort of improvise or think for themselves they're drilled um just talk a little bit about actually working with the choral kind of director for, 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 for this piece. I've been working with um, Andrea Brown, who is one of the very few women conductors in the country, in the world. She is extraordinary. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not, oh, I just don't know what I would have done without her. And the choir just loved her. Because she's firm, she challenges them, but she's nice. <laughs> she's not a rude, a belligerent, and oh, she just takes care of them. And because they're volunteers, absolutely, you should take care of them. And we're just watching her work and how she embraces them and brings them into the fold of everything, and how she works with our lead soloist. We have Victoria, who is a blind opera singer, who was on that tele program. I uh, can't remember what it was called. All together now, oh, I can't remember. She came third anyway. So Victoria is our angel, and um, she's, she's right at the very, very end in this glorious uh, angel-type um, monument, and. It's the, the wings are made out of scattered wooden planks, so they look like the planks of trestle tables, but um, shaped to be like wings. And there's a black woman in a white t-shirt with um, print, her print on the front. She just stares across the space, so the soldiers really fi can feel her looking after them. And at the other end, in another monument, and all the monuments you think, oh, it's a cenotaph, it's got names. It's not. It's all blanked out names. 
And it's blank out for all the people that came back disabled that haven't ever been named. The designer Liz Ashcroft is extraordinary as well. It's interesting, we've had I've got a hard on an all women team apart from one male choreographer. And the military is very male. And I, I, I'm just being interested, just having a little conversation with myself, how this would have been had I been a male director, whether it would have been a different process, well, of course it would have been, but whether they'd have been different, I don't know, because I've had some battles, and I think some of those battles is because I'm a woman. Interesting. Um, we, we, we may come back to this, but, and, and we will ask you, the audience, to come up with some questions. So if there's anything that we're talking, you think, I, I want to more, know more about this, then please sort of store them up and, and we'll ask you some, uh, to invite you to ask some questions shortly. Um, one of the things that happened in the preparation for this festival was um, Bill and I were driving, Bill's the creative uh, director, and Bill and I were driving through Europe at some point, and uh, Bill asked that um, sort of, existential question what should we, what are we going to do in 2020 and um uh apropos of just the the, the moment and the feeling i said it would i i i've oft, this is this sounds a bonkers idea but i've i've often um wondered what it would be like if we produced an opera and i'd read a, an article with um with jenny talking about her love of opera and how she'd always wanted to direct an opera. And some years ago, uh, probably a couple of years ago, I had a, a discussion with um, somebody uh, who said to me that um, opera, in all its forms, should not, be, not receive public funding, that it should be... Um, that public funding should be taken away and given to... Um, disability organisations or individuals or d diverse organisations and it should not go to the Royal Opera House and all of those things. And we had to have to say a he heated argument well into the night um, because as a disabled person myself, I felt that um, opera had been something that had inspired me and I wouldn't be here today had my parents not been involved in an amateur level of opera, had I not been uh, able to see Scottish opera as a young person, had I not been able to um, work with, um, during my university uh, time, uh, with English touring opera and English opera, all of those were, were moments that touched me and inspired me, because I think it's an art form that can, um, <coughs> uh, that, that has so many possibilities to inspire people. Um, so this kind of random thought took a very strange road and uh, Bill said well why don't we talk to Jenny and see if she has any interest in in directing said opera so we sat down over a lovely drink one night and 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 Jenny just talked passionately about her love of opera and I'd like you to maybe perhaps talk a bit a bit about what it is about opera that inspires you I, th I think because, I mean, I haven't seen loads and loads and loads of opera, but it's going to see, see something when you can't hear what they're singing is actually quite useful in a weird sort of way. Um, because you, you make up the story yourself. If you know the story, then you figure it out. But if it's new, or, or you don't quite know the full story, you could just watch... And I love watching the chorus, actually, because all these different individuals' responses to what they're singing gives a multitude of different ways into the um, into the piece. And I know choruses are supposed to be all the same, but we're not. People are not the same. But I, w I was at the ENO, and I was watching a rehearsal of Madame Butterfly. And, oh my God, and I just remember just weeping. And then I was allowed to go on the stage um, while they went off. And I stood on that, that beautiful big stage. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is, it's, it's big. But operas can be weird as well, couldn't they? And I, I've directed one tiny, tiny opera called Mad Meg for Interplay. It was written by Mike Kenny, who also wrote This Is Not For You. 
and it was a three-hander and a chalice. But all the other three actors, they sang and they played an instrument. I mean, my God, they were multi-skilled. But it was, again, sitting with Sam, going through all the music, the notes. And I'm saying, oh, Sam, I think there's too many notes there. Jenny, you do not say that to a composer. <laughs> but, but there are, it's cluttered. And sometimes I was right. I was right. I'm quite not sure how I was right, but I was. But it's about letting it's about letting the music wash over you. And last night I went to see Wind Resistant and had the play text, but it was too dark. And a strong, strong Scottish accent. So I got so I thought, right, okay, Jen, <laughs> it's fine. You're not gonna get this. But just watch and listen and just let it let it go over you. And it was really, really quite moving. And I made up my own story. So I suppose when when Monica came to talk to me, I thought, you are bound because this really is random. <laughs> I'd like to try and do an opera which is really is accessible so we would have someone like our gorgeous interpreter absolutely in the mix of it all. How do you, how, how do you make a really, really good accessible Opera where the audio description of what's happening on the stage, imagine opera not a lot happens, does it? Walk that way, walk that, walk that way. Uh, anyway, not in my opera, there's going to be a lot happening. Um, but how, how do you get the audio description for blind audiences into the fabric of it all? So they're not hearing it through headsets, they're hearing it and being part of the experience, but not feeling separated because they're listening to something with their ears, do you know what I mean? So... I think also there's such a myth about deaf people and music that you know, we can put our hearing aids onto a T-switch and if there's a good loop in the theatre, you could pick up sound. You might not pick up all the words, but with opera, nobody hears all the words, do they? <laughs> and it, that was quite an interesting conversation I had with Mike Kenny about this is not for you. He said, because he, he said, you can't always hear what the singer, singers are singing. So that was a conversation with Andrew. So Andrew really pushed for the diction of those words so they could be heard. But we worked with Talking Birds, and Talking Birds sort out having the text on your phone. It's a search engine. So quite a few people, hearing and deaf, had the words coming up on their phone so they could hear and see and take it all in. So that was one step in making it more accessible. But it's just um, deaf people do like music. Well, and, and we've, throughout the festival, we, we've um, continued to uh, kind of explore that theme. We had Evelyn Glenny, uh, one of you know the world's most famous percussionists who uh, is also deaf, performing with Addictive TV on, on Monday night. And, and she talks very much about listening through the whole body, not just through her ears, but through her whole body. Um, We'll come on to music. It's interesting, you mentioned Wind Resistance last night, uh, Kareem Poe, where it, uh, it struck me almost as a folk opera for one person. And it, and I'm very conscious that opera can be... Opera is, is, is music with, with, you know, telling a story through music, effectively, on stage. Um, it has many, many forms, whether that's um, a more musical version, whether it's a very classical version, a rock opera last night, I would say, was a sort of folk opera for one person. Um, have you got in your mind yet what this opera <laughs> may well look like? I know we've done some development work. Do you want to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing? Um, apropos of nothing, I had this um, weird encounter with a woman called Selena Mills because she was writing an article for The Spectator and she's a visually impaired woman. She is a force of nature. And we did what I had to do for the, the article that she was writing and they said, Jenny, I've got an opera for you. I thought, oh my God. And then immediately I had Bill and Monica on my shoulder thinking, oh my God, this might be something I can tell them. Hang on a minute, keep, keep, talking, keep talking to me. I said, you know, before that, did anybody watch um, Harry and Meghan's wedding? Yeah. No. The cellist played, how do you say it? The Canny Mason. The Skillian. No. 
uh, Sicilian, yes. So does anybody know who that piece of music is by? It's by Ron Parody. And that's what came up on the television. I didn't watch it. I was in Sainsbury's. I completely forgot. But anyway, um, Sainsbury's was empty. It was brilliant. Um, <laughs> but so, but Celine, Celine was saying that it just said uh, the Sicilian von Parody. But it's Teresa von Parody. It's a woman. And she was born in 1759 in the court of Austria to a very ri rich parents. And uh, her, her parents were counsellors to the empress. And she became blind when she was two from a smallpox. But because she showed a real skill in music, the empress gave her a pension to pay for her musical tuition. So she was a contemporary of Mozart's. And Mozart wrote sonatas for her, and so did Salieri. And she had a massive body of work of her own. But in that, in that time, and not dissimilar to now, actually, doctors and physicians were equated with God. You know, their word was gospel. So she spent a lot of her life having treatments trying to cure her eyes. Uh, lots of uh, valerian root having to wear a plastic mask over her eyes with stuff being shoved down it. I mean, electric shock treatment so that her eyes would bulge out. Ongoing, ongoing treatment. And then she had a massive um, space and time with, I can't pronounce it, is it Mesmer? Is that how you say his name, Dr. Mesmer? Alan Rickman played, there's a film about Mesmer played by Alan Rickman. Bless him. Um, and he spent days, months, years with her and p professed that he had killed her. And during, throughout all that process, she stopped composing any music. He said she was cured, but he took her soul. But she was actually still blind. And she took some convincing to try and get her parents to realise that she still couldn't see that that man had to be held up for court because he was a liar, he was a fraud. So he was banished and he went to live in Paris. Um, so, so then her creativity re-emerged. And there's several, um, there's several things about her. She was, she, she liked men. Whether or not she had Mozart or Salieri, I don't know, but I'm going to investigate more. But she did trottle, trottle around with sal the salons and have some fun. Good. <laughs> On her terms, why not? Or, you know, you know, good girl. Um, but the other thing is, sh she was also standing up then for women's rights. And a lot of her work has gone missing or just van somewhere out there in the ether. And she, she Selena, Selena was saying she thinks it's because, you know, Teresa did stand up for stuff. She did state facts. She did sometimes expose men, you know, before hashtag Me Too. She put, pulled people up. And so she thinks that the, there's a, some sort of like conspiracy theory that her work just went because of the type of woman she was and you weren't allowed to be that type of woman back then. So there's a fascinating amount of work about this woman, and that's that's the story I think I want to tell. And when she died in her 80s, she was a, uh, not not as old as that, but she died a very wealthy woman, and she left all her money to setting up the, f the only blind school for musicians in Austria. And Mozart dies a pauper, but everyone knows Mozart, Mozart but not very many people know about Teresa. So I think we need to know about her. It's a fascinating fascinating story when I, I read it and, and this whole idea that somebody who was so celebrated in their time is now nobody knows about them and yet Mozart as, as you rightly say everybody knows his name uh, even uh, it's, it's a kind of classic story of um, somebody that has been absolutely forgotten and it was it was fascinating to see that actually one of her pieces was performed at the royal wedding and yet, again, she wasn't properly credited as a woman composer. So let's go on to the music. You've been, you've been having some tentative discussions around the composer of the opera. Yeah, I don't know whether any of you know Erilyn Wallen. 
Yes. So, uh, so you've been talking to Erlen about working with us and collaborating on this project, um, which I think is fantastic. Somebody, it's a composer that we've wanted to work with as a festival for for some time, and uh, we were just delighted that we shared a kind of um, passion for her work. Um, and you've been doing some developmental workshops and things, we're haven't you? We've, we've had a long, long conversation with Erlen. And um, Bill, you might be able to help me out with the gaps in my memory. But one of the things she said, I mean, she has composed 16 operas, but she's still not up there with Philip Glass. Why not? And there's a, there's a wee parallel between Von Parody and Erilyn. And I, I wonder whether there's a bridge there. Because she's an extraordinary composer, she did the choir music for 2012, and um, it was quite an extraordinary piece of music with Bradley, who's I was my co-director, who <laughs> about music. I'm not, but he is so knowledgeable about music. He knew exactly what he wanted, and he wanted something that was just I can't say the word dis discordant. Dis and so, you know, when you all say that to Ellen, and she can give you this call, and oh my God, I'm quite going, what? But just think that. It was, can you remember, Helen? It was really hard music for them to play. Really, really challenging. Um, and what, but for this, she's really interested because there's some of Von Perdi's music does exist, and so does all the music that Salieri, Hayden, and Mozart, the things that they wrote for her. So there is a body of 18th century music. So how do we have that in the palm of our hands, as well as building in a contemporary voice of Erilyn and, and our librettist? So she's quite interested in that as a form. Um, and also how to tell a story about a woman that really resonates and so that that music gets under your skin and stays there so that you will never forget her and you will always be wanted to find out who are the other women musicians out there. I think that's what she really wants to get from this. So I'm going to um, open up uh, the floor to some to some questions from the floor because um, so if anybody's got any questions we've got a microphone roving so that the film uh, can capture your questions does anybody have an immediate question that they'd like to ask or comments oh can we just wait for the microphone so that we can capture it on film how you cast the opera will it be a mixture of local and professionals um, people that you know, how will it work for you? Um, we haven't got as far as that, but in terms of blind opera singers, there are a good few brilliant women. Uh, we had um, Denise Lee in 2012, didn't we? And then there's Victoria, who's in my show, This Is Not For You, and there's Amelia Cavello, who is not so much an opera singer, but my Gosh, she's got a good pair of lungs on her. There, uh, she's visually impaired as well. So there, there are definite people who can play Theresa Van Parody, parody. That's where it's down the line. And also for This Is Not For You, we worked with um, a, a young man called Laurie Chatterton. And wheelchair user, cerebral palsy, the first ever disabled student they've had at Guild, uh, Guildhall School of Speech and Drama, Music, Speech and Drama. So there, there are people out there, but we've got to start really doing some good investigation now. You know, the minute we find anyone who can do it, make sure that they've got enough opportunities to carry on singing, because that's what happens so often. Um, certainly for the disabled people, there are not enough performance opportunities. And that's why, you know, the, so, so, uh, th those directors out there say, well, the skill's not there. I think, well, you know, they need more opportunity so that we can keep practising, getting better and better at what we do. For a lot of people, the only place they can come to is grey eye. I mean, it is changing. But I hope, back to your question, I um, don't know the answer to that, but I hope that we will have a, a good core of professional disabled singers and I would really like to bring it I w the other thing I do want to do is a deaf opera with deaf people who really can't hear how they sing but like singing it'd be healthy hearing people would be great for us <laughs> <laughs> any other questions Anne 
Um, well, first, first of all, um, I knew we had a force of nature in Monica Ferguson here, but actually having you, Jenny, as a force of nature together on the uh, platform here with Monica um, is truly uh, inspirational and awesome. Thank you. It's terrific. Uh, uh, the ideas you've shared uh, sound absolutely fantastic as well. And I suppose this is a question to, to both you forces of nature, really. To what extent do you think you could use this moment, as you say, um, t uh, 10th anniversary of the festival, 50th anniversary of um, uh, the stables, the producer, and 40th anniversary of Grey Eye, to do something so original nationally and internationally uh, that it would really be uh, the statement piece of the of the festival and, and could attract significant artists and significant funding? I'll start... Um I think that's why we're starting it now um, in terms of the development and we've already done some work on this. Um, I think the key for me is about ensuring that um, the team which are, are putting this together are, as we always aspire to do with the festival, a really high quality team and I think we've, we've, we've got the bones of that. Um, I think we do have an aspiration to tour the work so that although it may be presented here initially um, that we would want to tour it certainly nationally if not internationally and that's one of the things that I think we need to nail in terms of the scale we've talked about you know is it is it is it a small chamber piece that goes into small scale is it a large piece is it an outdoor piece is it an indoor piece and we you know we've been bouncing those sorts of, of questions around um, and I think there is a real opportunity and I, I it's it for me it's the personal challenge to the person who said that opera wasn't for everyone and it may not be for everyone but everyone should have the opportunity to see it and experience it and somebody has nobody has the right to say to somebody that type of work is not appropriate for you and I think that's what between us we want to try and achieve with this that as wide an audience as possible and then making it as, as accessible for everyone not just for disabled people but for all people um, is my kind of passion for this and I think we need to do a lot in terms of audience development alongside the artistic development. But also to add to the festival you know who are the other deaf and disabled artists out there because we're, we're a big group now of some absolute gems that would fit in this environment very very beautifully so it's thinking about how do we build you know the next 2020 festival to to really make a statement about inclusion and accessibility so if grey eye is part of artist in residence that means we can get in there and get our hands dirty and really support building in for the infrastructure here for the future any other questions yes. i've got a question will you come <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and if anybody has um, any time you think, oh, I've got, I just want to Google something. Can you really help for people to Google um, information about Teresa von Parody? And if you could send it to Monica, then it can come to me, or just send it to Jenny at greyeye.org. Because you know, everyone finds that everyone's got different ways of navigating their way through the internet, and everyone finds out different gems. If you find out any gems or nuggets, or you think, "Oh, this might be quite interesting," please, because it, we're, we're we're really at the very very baby stage of all of this. So, if there's anything you want to contribute to it, that'd be great. Fantastic, um, Jenny. It's been a pleasure. I'm sure we will have many challenges ahead, um, but we look forward to working with you and with and with Grey Eye over the next two years. And as you say, using that opportunity to broaden our horizons um, at the festival and 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 make sure we reach as wide an audience as possible for all of our work. Um, so thank you for joining us as artists in residence, and we look forward thank to working you. with you. Debbie, thank you. Debbie, thank you for the for the for the interpretation today. Um, this, as I said, will go online, so there will be um, an opportunity for people to see it beyond today. But in the meantime, thank you. Thank you.